Dear colleagues, my name is Karel Olavarria, and I will present the work entitled Anaerobic Nadage Driven Polyhydroxybutyrate Accumulation in Echerichia coli. Polyhydroxybutyrate is a polymer produced by many species. The metabolic pathway leading to this accumulation is simple, but its material has limited properties. The production is still expensive in comparison with fossil fuel-based plastics. However, it's a good case study. PHB can be produced from several cardboard sources, including some uh, C1 compounds. The PHB production pathway starts at acetyl-CoA and embrace three reactions. This presentation will be focused in the second reaction catalyzed by the acetyl-CoA reductase. And uh, this reaction is typically assumed as a NAD pH consuming step. So basically the acetyl-CoA reductase is generally regarded as a NAD pH preferring enzyme. Why? The reason behind this assumption is because most of the studies done regarding PHV accumulation has been done using the genes coming from the bacterium Cupriavirus necator, which is a chemoautotrophic organism capable to accumulate PHV up to large titers, titers and with the ability to use hydrogen and fix CO2. Therefore, it seems a very interesting and promising platform. The genes uh, encoding for the reactions, uh, for the enzymes catalyzing the reactions leading to PHV accumulation in this bacterium were cloned and expressed in Nicharisha coli with success at the, at the end of the 80s of the last century. And specifically as the acetyl-CoA reductase of this organism is very not pH uh, specific. Therefore, it was assumed that this was the case in all major PHV accumulating organisms. However, the ability to accumulate PHB but using NADH instead of not pH has been already around from a very long time ago, but somehow has been neglected. The ability to make PHB reoxidizing NADH instead of NADPH has an important consequence. Um, when PHB is produced uh, associated with the reoxidation of NADPH, it is a process that competes with biomass formation. On the other hand, if we are capable to produce PHB link to the reoxidation of NADH, we will be producing PHV as a fermentation product. Therefore, the cofactor specificity of the acetyl-CoA reductase is a very important uh, property, a very important condition deciding if the PHV accumulation we will have is a NADH or NADPH driven process that will be or not competing with the biomass formation. To make my point more clear, here you can see a comparison of the thermodynamic profile of the ethanolic fermentation in comparison with the production or the potential production of polyhydroxybutyrate from glucose using a fermentative pathway. As you can see, the free energy produced in each case is pretty similar. Therefore, inspired by nature, we begin to study what was happening in the bacterium Candidatus accumulibacter phosphatis. Why? This organism is capable to produce PHV under anaerobic conditions with full electron conservation. This is possible because this organism is capable to mobilize an internal result of glycogen and at the same time take up acetate from the exterior and then produce polyhydroxybutyrate uh, from acetate and glycogen. And as I say before, with the full electron conservation, there is no production of other fermentation products. Um, 
Therefore, we obtained cell-free extracts from Candidatus accumulibacter phosphatis, and we decided to study there the specific activity of the set of acetyl-CoA reductase. For comparison, we use a cell-free extract obtained from E. Cherisha coli, expressing the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase from Cupriabius necator. As you can see in the graphic, uh, the activity in the cell-free extract from Accumulibacter sulfati was clearly not age preferring. The case was completely different in the case of uh, the cell-free extract coming from Escherichia coli expressing the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase from Cupravius necator. We cloned the gene encoding for the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase from Cupriabius necator. We purified the enzyme and we studied the kinetic parameters. And remarkably, it is the enzyme with the largest NADH preference so far described for these homologs, for the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase homologs. Moreover, we construct an artificial operand combining the genes encoding for the TLase and the PHB synthase from Cupriabius necator with the gene encoding for the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase from Candidatus accumulibacter sulfatis. In the same plasmid, we place the genes encoding for genes enabling the sucrose consumption in Escherichia coli K12. This way, we were capable to use sucrose as the sole carbon source and keep the plasmid inside the cells without the necessity of using antibiotics, using sucrose as the sole carbon source. With these strains, with, with this strain that we construct that also has several deletions uh, in genes encoding for enzymes uh, engaged in the production of competing byproducts, we set up uh, oxygen limiting in continuous cultures using sucrose as the sole carbon source. And as I say, with the, without the necessity of using antibiotics. In this table, you can see the main kinetic parameters obtained in two steady states. These two steady states are characterized by different rates of oxygen consumption. It is possible to see in this table that in the case of the steady state two with the smallest oxygen consumption rate, we obtain the largest PHV accumulation. Moreover, we also were capable to obtain a rate of PHV formation in a continuous mode. Therefore, with this data, we decide to understand what was happening that explains somehow why we didn't obtain a larger PHV content. When we try to decrease the oxygen consumption beyond the limit observed in the state state two, uh, the um, continuous culture show instabilities. So we decide to stop the experiment there. However, uh, with the measuring of the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase activity and a kinetic model that we developed, we were, we were capable to calculate the flux capacity in the system. Uh, the flux capacity associated with the PHB formation flux observed, which was around this number, 0 0.07 millimole per gram cellular weight per hour, correspond to a NAD age over NAD ratio of around 0 0.25. We then make a thermodynamic analysis to understand exactly where we are in, in, with the data that we obtain. In this graphic, what you are seeing is the thermodynamic driving force defined as minus the free energy uh, that we can obtain or that we will have in the reaction catalyzed by the acetoacetyl-CoA reductase in different situations, depending on the use of NADH 
or not pH and the redox states of these uh, cofactors. Mm -hmm. um, the green dot represent the NAD age over NAD ratio that we think that we obtain in the steady state two according with the kinetic analysis we did. And it is possible to see that we are in a situation where is intermediate between the two potential points we have if we drive this reaction using NAD age instead of NAD pH. If we drive this reaction using NAD pH instead of NAD age, sure, we will have a larger thermodynamic driving force. However, if we use NAD pH, as previously discussed, pH reaccumulation will be a process competing with a biomass formation. On the other hand, if we are capable to drive the pH reaccumulation using free oxidation of NAD age, we will be capable to produce pH as a fermentation product. However, the thermodynamic driving force will be lower. In the case of aerobiosis, the thermodynamic driving force will be very small, barely feasible. However, if we go, if we are capable to approach a situation of complete anaerobiosis, then we will should have a NAD age over NAD ratio, enabling a very large thermodynamic driving force, almost comparable with the situation we have using NAD pH. Therefore, as conclusion of this work, first, the acetoacetyl CoA reductase from Candidatus acumulibacter phosphatis is a NAD age preferring enzyme and can be engaged in pH reaccumulation in Sherisha coli. The pH reaccumulation in Sherisha coli using the acetoacetyl CoA reductase from Candidatus acumulibacter phosphatis increase with oxygen limitation. Kinetic and thermodynamics analysis help us to identify a target for further improvement. More specifically, we need to obtain larger fluxes in the reaction or a larger catalytic uh, capacity in the reaction catalyzed by the acetoacetyl coa reductase. And finally, the PHV accumulation driven by NADH reoxidation should enable more efficient and cheaper bioprocesses. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward for further questions, collaboration, and any other uh, thing that you want to discuss. I am open for that discussion. Thank you very much and have a good day. Hi, my name is Adriano Mariano and I'm an assistant professor of chemical engineering at Unicam Brazil. And I've been leading research in which you're interested in assessing the economics and the environmental aspects of using sugarcane as a feedstock to produce uh, tires. And we are also interested in improving the efficiency of conversion of sugars produced from the gas into chemicals that can be used to produce butadiene. Why sugarcane-based tires? Uh, more and more uh, uh, get natural gas has been processed by the petrochemical industry to produce ethylene. And the consequence of that is that the production of C4 olefins, including butadiene, has been decreasing drastically in the last decade. Here in Brazil, uh, we have a lot of natural gas asso associated with the oil, uh, Brissot oil reserves. Uh, so the question is, will the Brazilian petrochemical industry also tap on natural gas? This current change has have led uh, tire companies such as Michelin to search alternative feedstock to produce butadiene. And they have launched in 2012 the Bio Butterfly project that is, is seeking ways to improve the conversion of ethanol into butadiene, which is a process that has been practiced industrially in, in years ago and now has been uh, 
proposed and investigated by several research groups worldwide, including the U.S., uh, South Africa, Spain, and he, here in Russia, in this case of Russia, we have a, a company that is uh, have a pilot plant that they are converting ethanol into butadiene. There are also other options, and they are based on the C4 chemicals such as butane diol and butanol. And the idea here is that the, these chemicals could uh, yield better, we could have better yields uh, of butadiene if we use this kind of feedstock. Would these alternative options have a good fit with the Brazilian sugarcane males? Uh, the sugarcane mills in Brazil use sugarcane to produce ethanol and sugar, and the resulting bagasse is, is burnt to produce steam and power. And in the future, investment in second generation ethanol production, uh, the bagasse, uh, the, the cellulose fraction of the bagasse would produce glucose that can be easily fermented by saccharomyces cerevis, that is the yeast used in first generation ethanol plants. On the other hand, the hemp cellulose hydrolysate contains xylose that cannot be fermented by yeast, such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But uh, butanol and BDO produce microorganisms, they are bacteria and they can ferment xylose. So these uh, uh, advantages of the, the of microorganisms that produce BDO and butanol has have led as to this, our first research question is which of these routes would be more competitive to produce sugarcane based tires economically and environmentally? First generation ethanol, second generation and butanol, or uh, second generation butane diol. And we are all seeking ways to overcome technical challenges in this research. When we use bagasse to produce sugars, uh, the fibers would produce uh, uh, glucose and then it can be used to produce ethanol. On the other hand, the, the hemp cellulose hydrolysate contains a lot of inhibitors that they need to be detoxified in order to, for this sugar stream uh, to be fermented to produce uh, any chemical, including butanol and BDO. But it costs and there is also loss of sugar in this uh, step. And we are proposing this research, the use of molasses in order to overcome this challenging. It means that we want to have a process that doesn't need the detoxification step. So this has led us to our second research question. Can molasses be used to enable the fermentation of non-detoxified hemicellulose hydrolysate? An overall picture of the competing alternatives, we would have a sugar company sugarcane company producing uh, either first-generation ethanol that would be used by a chemical company to produce butadiene. Alternatively, companies that would invest in second-generation plants to produce second-generation ethanol, they could use the hemp cellulose hydrolysate to produce either butanol or butendiol, and these chemicals would supply a uh, butadiene plant. And this plant, butadiene plant, would be supplied by several sugarcane mills in a hub and spoke uh, network. And we are trying to find uh, which are the best economic and environmental options for both of, of the, 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 the components, uh, the sugarcane company and the chemical company. This research project started in 2018 and we have completed the tech and economic analysis. The life cycle analysis is in progress. The experiments regarding the butanol fermentation is completed. And the experiments regarding the BDO fermentation is also in progress. Uh, the tech and economic analysis has, uh, we have found that the, it's, it would be very, very challenging to use either butanol or BDO to produce butadiene if these chemicals are produced from the hemp cellulose hydrolysate. Um, if we compare the minimum selling price of these chemicals with the minimum selling price of ethanol, they are very, uh, they are extremely more expensive than ethanol. The reason why is, the reason why is that one, uh, second generation technologies are still expensive 
And here the investment cost would account for approximately 60% of the minimum selling price of these chemicals. And particularly in the case of using the hemp cell laws, hydrolysate, to produce these chemicals, uh, they would account for only 45% of the second, gen, second G plant output. We are assuming that the second G uh, ethanol would be sold at market price. So in order to guarantee a 10% IR of, for the investment, these, these chemicals would have to be sold at these prices. The advantage of BDO is, is related to the fermentation yield. The fermentation here is uh, yield is 0.35, and here the yield of butanol is 0.2, and we have a lot of acetone being produced also here. It's about 0.1, the yield of acetone, and that is sold at approximately $1,000 a ton. The result is, if we compare with the uh, market price of butadiene, it's about 1500 a ton, the ethanol route would be more competitive than the other routes, and the price would be about 1.3 higher than the market price. And the minimum selling price of butadiene, if produced from butanol and or BDO, it would be about 3 and 3.5 3 and times higher than the market price. If we have the point of view of the chemical company that is trying to be competitive and trying to sell uh, green butadiene at market price, uh, this company would have to buy either ethanol, butanol, or BDO at about half the market price in order to be able to sell butadiene at uh, the current market price that is about $1,500 a ton. Uh, the major reasons for that is feedstocks, the major cost item is about 80 to 90 percent, and the yields are still not that uh, good in terms of, especially when we look at the ethanol and BDO routes. And for that output of butadiene, we would need 1.1 plants uh, of first generation ethanol processing 4 million tons of sugar cane per year uh, produce ethanol and sugar. In the case of butanol, we would need 2.5 plants. And in the case of BDO, we would need 3.1 plants. It's interesting to, to note that in the case of this route, uh, we have also pr the production of ME key that is sold at about 1,900 ton. That is uh, a very interesting, interesting uh, co-product for this road. Regarding our strategies to enable the fermentation of non-detoxified hemicellulose hydrolysate, the butanol fermenting uh, microorganism was not able at all to ferment the non-detoxified uh, uh, hemicellulose hydrolysate. But on the other hand, when we start the fermentation with molasses, dilute molasses, and then we fed the hemicellulose hydrolysate at 24 hours, yes, the, the, the microorganism was able to ferment the, the xylose that, that is present here in the hemicellulose hydrolysate. In order for that to, 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 to happen, we used a dilution factor of four. So this is a limitation. Uh, the volume of dilute molasses is, is about three times the volume of hemicellulose hydrolysate. The direct consequence of that is that most of the butanol produced here is first generation butanol because the xylose account for only 10% of the sugar. In order to increase uh, the fraction of second generation butanol from the output uh, of, this, of this fermentation, we came up with the second approach uh, in which we try to increase the fraction of hemicellulose hydrolysate in the fermentation. Uh, we propose a free stage at fermentation with cell mobilization, uh, and they are conducted uh, uh, in a scheme that is repeated batch fermentation. In the first stage, uh, we start with molasses fermentation, then we change the fermentation medium 
and here the cells are, were immobilized in, sh in, in, the, in the sugarcane baguette itself. And here, in the second stage, uh, the, the, the tox hemicellulose hydrolysate was fed at 24 hour, as, in this, as we did in the first approach. And then from the four, third and so on uh, batch fermentations, uh, in the third stage, the, the fermentation initiated with the tox hemicellulose hydrolysate supplemented with molasses. In this case, uh, xylose was consumed by 33%, and the output of butanol that was second generation butanol increased from 10% from that we got in the first approach, and here we got four, about 40% 40 of the butanol was second generation. But we still, this is we still new, uh, we still need more research to improve the the sugar utilization. Further information regarding these studies you can find in these cheap publications that were uh, published in 2020 and 2021. Our concluding remarks is, are that definitely the first generation uh, ethanol route is the more economic attractive route to produce sugarcane based tires. But we need more efficient catalysts to convert ethanol into butadiene in order to make bio-based tires more competitive. But we also expect that the lower, the expect lower carbon footprint will certainly come at a price. And thirdly, the use of molasses in cell mobilization is a promising strategy to enable the production of butanol from non-detoxified hemicellulose hydrolysates. I'd like to thank all the people that have uh, been involved in this research from Unicamp and the Ohio State University. And I would like to thank the financial support from FATPAS and its BioN program, the CNPQ, and the material support from the INBR that produced the sugarcane uh, sugar bagasse hemicellulose hydrolysate at their uh, pilot plant at no service cost. If you have any for any questions, but you can reach me anytime. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Mario Murakami, the scientific director of the Brazilian Biorenewables National Laboratory. And today I'd like to tell you the development of a competitive microbial platform for enzyme production. Lignocellulose is a renewable, sustainable, abundant feedstock and uh, probably is the most promising feedstock to support circular bioeconomy. However, this material is highly recalcitrant and it has hampering its utilization in biorefineries. The complex mixture of cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin make it really hard to be break down into simple uh, components like monosaccharides. The enzymes typically used to make this process um, are inhibited by their own products and also by other components of the plants evolved, like aromatics from lignin. And there are, um, there are um, critical limitations of enzyme production. There, are, there is no local enzyme producers in Brazil, for instance. This is really hard. Um, hard to develop a strain able to produce high titers of enzyme uh, using low cost process, bioprocess. It results in uh, low sacrification efficiency, typically less than 60%, and in cost can be up to 50% of the total process. For instance, for second generation ethanol, it ranges from 35 to 50% of the total cost of the final product. Uh, so enzymes are really relevant in the industrial process in obtaining bioproducts from um, the biomass lignocellulose material. <laughs> to address this key challenge, um, the goal of our study was to, so, to develop an industrially competitive microbial platform for local production and tailor it to the features of the Brazilian biomass. Some uh, um, uh, 
things that should be considered in this discussion, this presentation, is regarding the lack of literature how to develop this strain. The best numbers so far are from the VTT, uh, 40 grams per liter, but uh, they use a proprietary strain, not a public strain. Uh, and historically, literature strongly discouraged anyone to start to develop a competitive strain from a public available microorganism. It is, um, there is a common sense in the community that it would take several or even decades for the development, and it is very unlikely to be achieved by means of rational design. And the third point, the typical enzyme producers are filamentous fungi, and these microorganisms are not so easy to domesticate and to, genetic, and to be genetically modified. So these are some key uh, um, challenges regarding this study. Uh, we choose in, in our research uh, hold C30 as a shortcut. It's like, this is an extraordinary microorganism. It was developed by Douglas in Hutchers using several rounds of chemical modification. And we are very thankful to Doug for making it available and public. And this strain uh, produces more than 50% 50-fold increase in, in, in the enzyme production compared to its parent dog strain, QM6A, and also is partially catabolite the repressed. This is a very good starting strain, but not competitive because it has many uh, deficiencies like uh, the requirement of inducers for cellulose production. It is still have many proteases that decreases the stability of the enzyme cocktail. It lacks beta-glucose dose activity, resulting in yielding the accumulation of cellular biology cannot be used by other microorganisms for bioconversion to biochemicals, biofuels, and biopolymers. It is only partially catabolite depressed. It means that increasing amounts of glucose decrease the enzyme production. And the last uh, limitation is not able to utilize sucrose. If you, for instance, in Brazil, we have a lot of a byproduct from sugar industry that is molasses. So we cannot use it as a carbon source in this process. There are some limitations of strain. And uh, another point is the, the lack of molecular tools for, molecular tools for the development uh, for genetic engineering of this microorganism. So the first thing that we did at our lab was the development of some plasmids, some um, tools to, to, to make these modifications possible. Uh, of course, we based it on CRISPR-Cas9 technology. The idea was to make double modification in a single step to save time. And the third point was to express, uh, to have the Cas9 enzyme being expressed at a very low, constitutively at a very low level to avoid off targeting and also to decrease the, the cost of the, the system without uh, using the purified protein. So these are two features of this, this tool that we customized for our strain. The, the first part uh, of the, the rational design of the modifications and encompass the engineering of transcription factors. There are several described in the literature. These are activators, transcriptional, transcriptional activators that are um, usually uh, modulated by inducers like lactose, sulfurose, and cyanobiose. On the other hand, there are uh, repressors like P1, ACE1, RCE1, for instance, that uh, inhibit the cellulose production 
in the presence of increasing amounts of glucose or cyanose, for instance. It is, uh, of course, there are many other transcription factors that are not known um, yet, and it is still very poorly understood how uh, synergistically uh, are the effects on the combined effects of these transcription factors. So, so studies are often limited to specific uh, transcription factors, not the combination of them. So in this study, we deleted the ACE1 and uh, constitutively expressed the SHU01 with a mutation to make it less um, sensible to silos, for instance. And here is the result, these two strains, TR, TRR2 and 3, contain this double modification. And you can clearly see the up to threefold increase in protein production from three, around three grams per liter in the white type strain. And after the deletion of S1 and expression, constitutive expression of Zero one with the mutation, we are re we are reaching nearly uh, 11 grams per liter of protein, indicating that it was um, it improved the the, the the capacity of hood C30 secrete proteins. The second modification was to make this strain uh, able to metabolize molasses sucrose as a carbon source. It's highly abundant in Brazil, low cost, and it, it is uh, an interesting uh, um, feedstock for this process. As I said, uh, wood C30 lacks the, the enzyme infectase to break down it, and the disaccharide into uh, its monosaccharides. And then we use the invertase from aspergillus and here we can see the result. Uh, this is uh, the parental strain, this engineered strain, uh, zero, day zero, day five, near the, the, the same concentration of sucrose, indicate the parental strain is not able to use sucrose as carbon source. And here we see that it was fully uh, consumed, metabolized by this uh, engineered strain after the insertion of the invertase from aspergillus. Another problem regarding these strains is beta glucose these activity levels. It is probably well known for most of people watching this video that glucose is the last step of the last step of the enzymatic cascade of cellulose degradation. And uh, the lack of this activity results in the accumulation of cellobiose. Here we we use it, the enzyme from uh, Chloromyces emersoni G3-beta-glucosidase. We compare the, the enzymes from trichoderma or with the R type beta-glucosidase and with the, the one from um, Chloromyces emersoni, you see the much higher efficiency of this enzyme. This enzyme is more thermostable than the, the wire type from trichoderma. And this highly complex protein with zero modules and highly glycosylated this protein uh, seems to be much more promising than the wire type. So we made the modification. And here is the result. We see these two strains contain the the constitutive, constitutive expression of this beta glucose days from Thalamus and Bersoni, and see you see the full consumption of cell biology while the parental strain still accumulates high amounts of cell biology. Another change was deleting proteases. So we learned from a very nice paper from BTT that they analyzed the degradation of antibodies. Uh, produced by trichoderma, they identified several proteins that could decrease the stability of these antibodies. And we observed that PIP1 seems to be one of the most expressive 
um, significant protease in, um, in the secretion that could decrease the stability of the secreted proteins. And then when we made this deletion, we had an improvement of nearly 24, 24% uh, in, in the protein factors indicating a key hole of proteases uh, uh, in modifying the stability of the cochlea. So what these results uh, mean to us, we, we probably can consider that it is breaking the paradigm because we reached the titles of 80 grams per liter and the best in the literature, as I said, is nearly 40 grams per liter uh, um, that was obtained by a proprietary strain from VTT. And key, key uh, aspect of this research is that is fully uh, rationally designed. We have FTO, we have applied it to patent of this very process and engineered microorganism. We start from a public strain and we have industrial conditions and it was uh, um, is being uh, scaled up in the pilot plan. Not, uh, not on about the quantity but the quality. So here regarding the sacrification we have CTEC2 as a reference here and we have the different versions of this strain, engineered strain and as you can see, regarding glucose and laws and the total sugars, it's very clear that the efficiency of this cocktail is similar to commercial solutions. Uh, and some key points of our technology. First, it can be locally produced only by products of the, the, the uh, sugarcane industry can be used to produce this enzyme. It means no downstream, no transportation, no storage that significantly de decrease the cost. And as I said, it can be used, uh, it is, is being scaled up in the pilot plan. Regarding the cost, we started here and now we are a few cents of dollars that is very uh, near to the low range uh, according to this publication. Indicate it is truly competitive. That's all that I'd like to tell you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Cristiane Sanchez Farinas, and I'm a researcher at the Embrapa Instrumentação in São Carlos, São Paulo, Brazil. And today I will be talking about our work on green and sustainable manufacture of nanocellulose materials in integrated biorefineries. Our research group at Embrapa is working on developing process strategies to contribute to this great challenge of our society in this transition to a bio-based and economy. And we understand that lignocellulosic biomass is one of the most promising options uh, for replacing non-renewable resources to obtain energy, bioproducts and novel materials in accordance to the biorefinery concept. So for today's talk, I, I'm going to present some of the results of our group related to process engineering strategies using the biochemical route with enzymes to obtain nanocellulosic materials. And in this context, the conversion of biomass into biofuels and by other bioproducts using en the enzymatic route is being considered as the most sustainable from the point of view of sustainability. We already know that. And for that, uh, the biomass needs to go to a pretreatment step to facilitate the action of the enzymes in the enzymatic hydrolysis reaction to release simple sugars that can be fermented into ethanol. And however, with uh, even all the efforts to increase the efficiency of the enzymatic hydrolysis step to obtain cellulose for the produ production of soluble sugars, in this process uh, of cellulose hydrolysis, there is still a residual material 
that is mainly formed by a more crystalline fraction of the cellulose. And this is because the enzymes, they act in most the amorphous phase of cellulose. And a potential application to this residual solid material is to obtain nanocellulose, which is a high value product. And the idea of the integrated production of sugars and nanocellulose in a biorefinery context is being studied by our research group as part of our thematic project on FAPESP, and which is the nanocellulose production. Uh, it's integrated with the production of ethanol and biodiesel in an integrated biodiesel bioethanol biorefinery in which besides a biofuels, other bioproducts with higher added values such as surfactants, carotenoids, esters will be also obtained within the biorefinery. And among the nanocellulose, this type of material has been classified as CNC, that stands for cellulose nanocrystals, CNF, that stands for cellulose nanofibrils, and also a BC, that stands for bacterial cellulose, that, uh, which is a type of nanocellulose that's synthesized by certain strains of bacteria. So it's, it's a different in terms of source, but it's also, we can consider it a type of nanocellulosic material. And in a general way, we could classify uh, cellulose and nanocrystals as structures that contain mainly the cellulose, uh, the crystalline fraction of cellulose, which is mainly obtained by acid hydrolysis. And with the structure, we could compare to uh, grains of rice. And while uh, cellulose and nanofibrils are fibers containing both the amorphous and crystalline fractions of cellulose forming a structure that would be similar to spaghetti. And nanocellulose can be obtained from different materials, including agroindustrial residues, such as sugarcane baguette, straw, uh, others such as banana strain, stem, rice straw, soybean hulls, and so on. And what makes nanocellulose so interesting is the properties of this nanomaterial, such as its renewable nature, which can be obtained from several sources, including agroindustrial residues. It has excellent mechanical properties due to its high surface area. It's biocompatible and may have uh, applications in the pharmaceutical and medical fields. The chemical surface of this material also can be modified depending on the application. And it also has interesting optical properties and can be used in electronic devices, sensor industries, and so on. And all these uh, properties have stimulated the interest of several potential applications uh, in the medical industries, cosmetics, automotive, auto, automotive sector, new materials, sensors, and so on. And in our research group, we studied uh, the feasibility of obtaining cellulose and nanocrystals from the residual fraction of sugarcane baguettes. And for that, we used the solid residue obtained after the enzymatic hydrolysis of the baguettes. And in this study, the sugarcane baguettes was subjected to two types of uh, pretreatments. So we used steam explosion and liquid hot water pretreatment. Then the material was followed by enzymatic hydrolysis reaction with different enzyme loadings to release the soluble sugars. And then the solid residue from the enzymatic hydrolysis was uh, purified to remove lignin and then submitted to acid hydrolysis to generate then the cellulose and nanocrystals. 
and the results of the characterization my microscopy showed that the material was obtained uh, by both type of pretreatments uh, presented uh, CNC uh, characteristics né? and this material was also characterized by atomic force microscopy, which allowed the characterization in terms of the size, length, and diameter, and the calculation of the aspect to ratio, which is an important parameter for to characterize this type of material. And the results show that for both types of pretreatment, the CNC showed a spec to ratio between 11 and 15, which is a value within the range expected for this type of materials. And the samples also presented the crystallinity index above 80%, which is also a typical value for CNCs. And the thermal properties of these materials showed temperatures degradation above 200 degrees which are these temperature are required when we intend to use CNC in the processing of polymeric materials. So uh, we need to have this uh, time, type of thermal stability of the material. And in this other project, we, the idea was to investigate the possibility of using, of obtaining CNC using only the enzymatic route. So the question that we wanted to answer was, is it possible to obtain cellulose nanocrystal using only enzymes? And so for this, we studied the, we, in the enzymatic hydroxy process of the cellulose uh, eucalypt pulp, uh, we studied uh, different uh, enzyme loadings and solid loadings. And, and these two uh, surfaces were superimposed to find an optimal condition that would allow to obtain a, a condition with high glucose concentration in the, as a result of the hydrolysis associated to a residual fraction of solids that would also allow us to obtain the nanocellulose material. And once this condition was uh, defined, the strategy was to continue manipulating the reaction conditions such as time and temperature so that we could obtain at the end of the reaction uh, cellulose nanofibers and also cellulose nanofibrils, I'm sorry, cellulose nanocrystals associated with uh, glucose concentration in a, an amount sufficient to alcoholic to obtain, uh, to use in the process of ethanol fermentation. Uh, this nanocellulose material was characterized in relation to the crystallinity, crystallinity index, and also in terms of the size, showing all these numbers that are typical for a CNC material. And an interesting properties of this uh, material was related to the thermal stability, which we obtained thermal stability around three hundred degrees, which is a very interesting temperature, especially for applications. So here we show that it was possible to obtain cellulose nanocrystal using only enzymes. And the next, next question that we wanted to answer was related to the uh, possibility of using sugarcane residues, uh, both sugarcane baguettes and sugarcane straw uh, using, uh, using this material to obtain nanocellulose by the enzymatic route. And for that, we pretreated the materials, both the sugarcane baguettes and sugarcane straw 
in order to remove most of the emicell loss and lignin fractions, as you can see in these images. And next, the materials were hydrolyzed using the same commercial enzymatic cocktail designed to release soluble sugars. So we also could make sure that a soluble sugar stream was being released and that could be used for ethanol fermentation. And the solids residues from the enzymatic hydrolysis step were then characterized in terms of size, showing an average size that was within the expected range for nanocellulose. And the analysis of the thermal properties of this material show, showed degradation temperatures above 300 degrees, which also is very interesting, especially for applications, as I mentioned, for in the processing of these polymeric materials. Um, the next challenge that we wanted to investigate it was related to the possibility of using enzymes produced in-house to obtain nanocellulose. And for that, we produced the enzymes using filamentous fungi. Uh, we use the filamentous fungi uh, Aspergillus niger, and we cultivated this uh, fungi under solid state fermentation. And we obtained an enzymatic complex with a high endoclast endoglucanase activity. Then we evaluated uh, different combinations of processing using ball milling and sonication to obtain the nanostructures. And the nanocellulose was also characterized in terms of crystallinity index and, and also in terms of the size and thermal properties showing and all these typical values that was possible to classify this material as cellulose nanocrystals. So with these results, we could demonstrate uh, that was uh, possible to obtain cellulose nanocrystal using the enzymes produced in-house. So that was a very promising uh, results for our group. So with that, I would like to thank all the students and researchers involved in, in this uh, work. And also I'd like to thank the institutions, especially FAPESP that supported our work. Thank you very much.